speaker is also a stubborn dreamer. He may be one of the more stubborn people in Canada. Richard Bradshaw is the conductor and director general of the Canadian Opera Company. And despite the fact that this world-class city insists on behaving like a one-horse hick town, Richard is determined that we will have an opera house that meets our own sense of self. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Anyone who's spent the last three days listening to so many brilliant and uh, brilliant presentations and inspiring ideas has to be intimidated. And I'm sure intimidated. In fact, when I was shaving this morning, I was considering ways of escape. <laughs> and, um, for some reason, an old soldier's saw from the Second World War popped into my mind. Uh, though we observe a higher law, and though we have a quarrel just, were I permitted to withdraw, you wouldn't see my ass to dust. <laughs> um, however, I'm here, but I have another dilemma, and that is that uh, I'm quite used to advocating uh, the good things about the arts, you know, that they're un underfunded and that they're necessary and all those things. But I have a strong suspicion that I'm preaching to the converted. And if I went that tack, you know, thank you. <laughs> and if I went that tack, you'd be bored. And I'm with Vedekind, rather a whore than a bore. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm not going to do that either. But I do have to sell tickets quite a lot. In fact, I dream about selling tickets. Um, and I came across something that Peter Sellers, Peter Sellers as in the director, not the former comedian and film star, said recently, which pulled me up short, and I think it's worth talking about, should this appear. A lot of productions are important, not because anyone saw them, but because they heard about them. People's imagination of what happened on stage is even more important than what happened on stage. The most important nights in the theater were seen by only a tiny fraction of the population, and yet they have passed into the history of the world. That's a pretty startling statement. Um, and I started to think about it in the context of a successful production that we did with Robert Lepage and Michael Levine, an all-Canadian team, of Schoenberg's Erwartung, which looks something like that. It destroyed our sense of vertical and horizontal. Uh, it was a production, I think, which, in which one heard with one's eyes and saw with one's ears. And it went everywhere. We'd, we'd done it twice in Toronto. It went to the Edinburgh Festival. It went to the Melbourne Festival, to the Hong Kong Festival to BAM in New York, to Geneva, to Cincinnati, to Vancouver. It's been seen, I mean, for, a, for a, an, a piece of the 20th century, it's had a colossal audience. Yet I think still what Sellers was getting at is right. That what that production did here and elsewhere was to create a climate in which the arts could flourish. Now, it's interesting. And I don't know if it's anything to do with that, but last week at the TSO, Schoenberg's Guru Leader was sold out for the performances. Or I know after Edinburgh that Paris decided to put on a Schoenberg festival. That's only the tip of the iceberg. It's much more important that the climate that one begins to create through a production like that Lepage, Erwartung, makes other things possible. And so subsequently we've seen the work of the Montreal film director Francois Girard, Oedipus Rex, that's the final big tableau. We've seen adventurous productions of Wagner. Well, it was very adventurous. <laughs> no, that's not Wagner. That's Atomagoyan's uh, Salome, and that's the dance of the seven veils, although in that production there were, as you may know, no veils. Um, <laughs> what mattered is that I think Robert, in a sense, here and elsewhere, 
made all sorts of things possible. And in that sense, it was more important what was heard about that production than actually seeing it. It changed our vision, it changed our perceptions, and it changed, I think, cultural boundaries. I think Sellers was also getting at something else. Even that, though that production has now been seen by, I don't know how many people, way, way, way over 100,000 people, much more than that, than I should think, two and a half times that now. Still, in the big wide world, it's seen as a minority culture. That dreaded word, elitism, creeps in. It's seen to be something which is not for everyone. And I think that Peter was niggling away about that. Now, I'm going to quote three Peters tonight. Let's have Peter number two. This is Peter Jonas, the very brilliant director of the opera in Munich. And this is slightly wordy, but glad you can read it, and I hope I can, because it's quite profound. Culture is the thumbprint of civilization. There are many thumbprints, and each one is individual. The summary of all these individual thumbprints makes up our own personalities and the collective personality of society. The essence of the collective ritual, sport, religion, or art, and I'm going to come back to sport, is to bring people to the highest point of excellence to create an elite to which people aspire, and then open up the elite so that it's accessible to everyone. This sounds like something Moses might have said. The point is not to adapt to the lowest common denominator of people's readiness to absorb what that collective has to offer, but to give people the chance to become part of that elite. Now, there are a number of things in there which would upset an awful lot of people, because the very sense of the word elite uh, causes a lot of trouble. But think for a moment of what is perhaps obvious. Why do painters paint? Why do poets write poetry? Why do composers write music? Because they have something in them which they can only say through that medium. And in the case of great composers and great poets and great painters, they have something of extraordinary significance to say. And the history of the arts is the history of civilization at its most glorious and in all its depth and complexity. And so one of the things that bothers me about the eternal tag that I hear about opera being elitist, uh, and not only opera, is that when we talk about sports, we don't think like that. There's never any problem of aspiring to the the absolute pinnacle, the acme of possibility. And yet in the arts, increasingly, there's creeping in a lowest common, a lowest common denominator factor, the sort of thing that Peter Jonas deplores. Com repeatedly, I've been told about music that's being written, new opera, of which I'm glad to say we're doing a lot, and Alexina Lewis here, who's doing a new piece for us at the moment. Repeatedly, I'm being asked, will it be accessible? And accessible, I think, is a dangerous word. And I'm getting to the point where I think we should demand more of ourselves. I don't believe ever in the lowest common denominator. And I'm frightened by the extent to which the arts are apologized for. Now, our prime minister, splendidly, the other day, about six weeks ago, announced a very considerable infusion of new money into the arts, and I applaud it. And I'm glad he did it, and I think he was brave, because he knew that there wouldn't be a great deal of praise coming down to him for throwing money at the arts. The sad thing was that he felt it necessary, when he announced this bonanza, to start his speech by saying, I know there are no votes in the arts. He's right, probably. I don't know. But it was a way of saying, look, this isn't going to get me anywhere, but I think I should do it. And good for him that he had the courage to do it. Similarly, this isn't confined to Canada. Similarly, recently, the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, uh, they've got a funding crisis in the arts, which is similar to ours. Um, 
he got a number of arts luminaries together and said, what are we going to do? And during the course of the conversation, he talked to a colleague of mine. And he said, look, it's not money. The money is nothing. If I looked after the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, all the London orchestras, all the theatres, the Royal Ballet, the lot, it's nothing. It's a drop in the bucket. But how do I sell it to the tabloids? Now, unfortunately, the colleague I'm mentioning is serially indiscreet, and he re immediately reported it to the tabloids, and so that, for the time being, is the end of that. But my concern is that we have to get away from apologizing for this unfortunate necessity called the arts and get to the point of celebration. And so that when the Prime Minister puts 650 million new money into the, the arts, this is something which hits the headlines as one of the most exciting days in Canada that's ever lived. Let's go to Peter number three. This is the great Peter Brook. The person who is touched by the transcendental nature of human experience, the why, forgets the how. On the other hand, anyone who's acclaimed as a good craftsman and a real professional carries the danger that through their craftsmanship, their professionalism, their routine, the great why shrinks to the proportions of the how. I hate to talk about the how, uh, because this has been a visionary meeting of minds here where people have talked about ideas and what's possible. And they've really talked about the why. Um, I mention the how, how because there is almost, almost, I said almost, no great cultural institution in Canada that is not in dire financial trouble. And I was poignantly reminded of this when I was, uh, about a week and a half, two weeks ago, I was conducting in Tbilisi, as in the Republic of Georgia, where the average salary, a good average salary in Tbilisi, is $60 Canadian a month. Uh, a ticket to one of the concerts I was conducting was about, uh, I'm converting, $20. Canadian, a third of a month's salary. And the lowest tickets were $4, which is half of what a lot of people earn in a week in Tbilisi. In fact, orchestral players are more like $30 a month. And yet, at those concerts, the lines were down the street beyond where you could see to try at, in some way to get in because those people believed that this festival, which was the first in Tbilisi and was made possible, I'm glad to say by foreign aid, including Canada, uh, they, they felt that this was something to be saved for, to be sacrificed for. And what I was aware was of a great passion for the arts, which I think in our more comfortable societies we often lose. Incidentally, it's ironic that there's a rather splendid 18, 1860s, I think it was, opera house there, um, which burned down in the 1970s and was immediately refurbished and restored and rebuilt to its former glory, not because there was a budget to do so, but because they couldn't imagine life without it. And that, I think, is a salutary lesson for us. If we believe with André Marlowe, the great French statesman who did more for changing the face of the way the arts are viewed in France, and my goodness, they have it easy. Uh, Malraux said, all art is a defiance of man's fate. Through art, a nation rids itself of its demons. If we believe that, then we should be concerned for the fate of the soul of our country. We should be concerned to celebrate and not to apologize. And after this extraordinary and magnificent meeting of minds, I hope that we shall go away and not forget the why, nor let our vision be blunted by the how. Thank you.